Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in AP English. And we turn now to a study of the famous Epic of Gilgamesh. Now, we've already covered the important epics of the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid. We've talked about Greek drama. We've talked about Plato and his famous dialogues of Apology and Republic. We've talked about Marcus Aurelius and his meditations. And before we turn to the next great epic that we will look at, the Anglo-Saxon epic Beowulf, we want to pause for a moment and talk about maybe the oldest epic in the history of storytelling, the Epic of Gilgamesh. It comes from ancient Mesopotamia. It's maybe the earliest surviving work of literature that we have. It was discovered in the 18th century uh, BC by um, Austin, uh, um, I'm sorry, um, Common Era, by um, Austin Layard and a, 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 a cat named Rasmund and uh, left us in 1853. Uh, finally, uh, we get a first modern translation in the early 1870s by uh, George Smith. The um, Chaldean account of Genesis in 1880 is an important uh, part in the history of the translation. Now I'm gonna say a lot about this. There's a lot out there now that's published about this famous epic and it's 11 tablets. Uh, it's sometimes referred to as chapters. Okay. We want to talk, first of all, about why this is an important text and why we need to look at it. We then want to briefly summarize the Epic of Gilgamesh, and then we want to come back to work with our uh, three levels of, or our last two levels of reading, right? Level one summary, uh, level two, uh, of course, a, what, what our theme's message is to be. Obviously, we're talking rhetoric. We're going to look at that, but let's start, first of all, with why it's important. The hero story is central to this text as it is central to almost all of the epic texts that we study. Right? When it was discovered, it created a huge sensation because sitting at the heart of the Epic of Gilgamesh is the story about some kind of universal flood and the quest for immortality through some kind of tree of life. And obviously there were a whole lot of people that were very quick to want to say, well this sounds a whole lot like Biblical texts, of course, biblical texts redacted 580, uh, in, in 586 BCE during the time that the Hebrew people were led out of exile from Jerusalem to where? Babylon, where, of course, this epic of Gilgamesh comes from. And so comparative religious studies went into um, high gear as this text was found. Um, comparative analysis in regards to other, other kinds of uh, existing texts as well are so hypercritical for us. In other words, this story I'm about to tell you predates anything Iliadic, anything that's Odyssean, anything that's obviously Virgilian and, uh, and the Aeneid, predates anything Beowulf, predates anything, and on and on and on it goes. Because that's the case, this is kind of like we might say the template text for all epics. The obvious question you might ask me then is, why didn't we just start with the Epic of Gilgamesh? And we certainly could have, no question. But we wanted to make sure that we, that we understood basic structures of the epics before we then come to maybe the oldest epic and say, what's up with this, uh, with this story? Now again, to go back to what we've already said about epics, we are defined both individually and as a peoples by the stories we tell, the stories we accept, the stories that we reject, yes? And we'll remember in our study of Plato's Republic that this is fundamentally our education. So when we look at this epic of Gilgamesh, we're going to ask some similar kinds of questions about what, what kind of culture holds to a story like this, right? Now, just to remind, we're working first at level one, then at level two, what does the text mean to a theme's messages? At 2B, the rhetorical level, we're going to concentrate on the same thing that we concentrated on with our study of Iliad, Odyssey, Aeneid, the symbolism and the irony at 2B. And then finally, at level three, um, how can I relate to this text at 3A? How can I relate to other texts, like the other epics that we've looked at already? It's one of the reasons why I hold the Epic of Gilgamesh until now. And then finally, 3B, can I own the text by asking how can I relate to it personally and the like? All right, let's do a real quick now summary of this text, the tablets. I'm not going to go tablet by tablet or chapter by chapter. I'm just going to work through the actual storyline itself, all right? We begin with Gilgamesh the son of a man and a goddess, so right away, like 
Achilles. This is a man who has a human father and a goddess, in the case of Achilles, obviously, Thetis, a, 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 fe a goddess uh, for his mother, right? So it makes him special already. He's the king of the Sumerian city, think Babylonian in that region, right, where the Tigris and the Euphrates are. Um, and he is the king of an important city-state named Uruk, okay? U-R-U-K is usually how this is uh, transliterated, okay? There's two things we want to say about him right away and, and in the story. And by the way, the, the characters in our story are not going to be as redacted, well-redacted or rounded as we're going to see in, for example, the Homeric epic uh, tradition or for sure in Virgil and, and, and that kind of thing. But what we do know about him is that he is the man of all men. He's con I mean, he drives all the young men nuts with feats of strength in Uruk and that kind of thing. He's always wanting to have these kind of contests with them. And he's always messing around with the young girls. So in other words, here we have what we might think of as the quintessential, what, college, you know, uh, frat boy who is unable to control his desires and all of that. I mean, if you'll think in the Platonic terms, he is quintessentially the democratic man or the tyrannical man. In other words, he loves to show great feats of prowess and obviously sexual virility, all right? Um, uh, it, 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 in this regards, the people of Uruk have had enough of him, and they pray to the gods for help, and Anu, think of Zeus here, the king god, right, will send Aruru, which you might think of her as kind of Hera and Athena, to create an equal for Gilgamesh, and this will be the production of Enkidu. Now, Enkidu is going to be kind of like the foil or the mirror image in many ways of, uh, of, um, uh, of our hero in Gilgamesh, all right? Now, let's talk about Enkidu really quickly. This is an interesting guy. From his inception, from his creation, his birth, he's kind of a wild man, living out in the woods, um, uh, the natural man. We might think of him as Rousseau's natural man, that man in the state of nature and all of that. Um, and he starts to bug anyone that comes from the city, and he bugs this trapper. Um, at a watering hole over and over again several times and the trapper will ask Yurik for help and say there's some kind of crazy man out in the out in the woods now think about Yurik and the fascination that today people have with you know these notions like Bigfoot you know what I'm saying there's something that lives in the woods that's like really really foreign and some people say they've seen him and you know that kind of thing well this is a similar kind of construction of our story here um, Gilgamesh the king of Yurik will say you know I, I think we have a way to maybe solve our problem. And the problem is solved, if that's the way we want to say it, by sending back to Yurik um, Shamat, who is a temple prostitute. So this tells us a lot as well about the religious practice of the day in Mesopotamia. So there's women who you can go and sleep with in the temple as uh, some kind of celebration to the gods. Of course, the Greeks, especially in Corinth, had the same project happening there, right? So anyway, you have this temple priestess who will go out and she will sleep and she will subdue, can we say this in our notes, civilize Enkidu, okay? So he sleeps with the woman. And right away, by the way, we get this tension now between the natural man and civilization. When the woman comes out and she sleeps with Enkidu, already Enkidu begins to realize there's things that once he could do that he can't do. For example, he doesn't have the same kind of speed and quickness and virility against the animals. In other words, he increasingly becomes more human, we might say, right? But we'll find out that while this happens to his physical body, his mind begins to become more aware. Think of Plato's cave allegory in Republic 7, all right? Enkidu then will live with uh, Shaman and become civilized. Think about Odysseus, for example, living with Calypso or for that year living with Circe, right? Okay, same kind of gig is being played. Shaman mentions Gilgamesh Enkidu says, I'd really like to meet him, and you get this sense that maybe there will be a contest between the two, and in the end, maybe uh, even fight him. Gilgamesh has had dreams that maybe it's time for him to have an equal as well, and maybe a contest with an equal. Enkidu then will go to Europe, fight Gilgamesh, and he will lose. This is significant. He can't win. But ironically, right away, they become best pals. And of course, this is a famous epic tradition as well. Think about all of the different kinds of 
great friendships that we can think about or relationships in epics. Obviously, there's Achilles and Odysseus, Odysseus in the Odyssey with his son Telemachus at the end. There's Beowulf and Wiglaf at the end of Beowulf, right? There's Don Quixote and Sancho Panza. I mean, these kinds of relations. Think in the biblical tradition of David and Jonathan. So there's this kind of notion of two friends. They're in some ways kind of competitors, right? Think of Odysseus and Achilles as a classic exemplar of this. Uh, but they also care deeply for each other, right? Okay. For reasons that are not totally clear, now time will pass, by the way. That's kind of the first part of our story, by the way. Okay, so Enkidu and, uh, and, and Gilgamesh become pals. For, uh, time will pass. For reasons that are not totally clear, okay, uh, maybe it's just the need for adventure because when you have these really adventurous types, they get tired of sitting around just governing or whatever, right? They decide that they need to go on a, an adventure, on a voyage, all right? And they decide, you know what, let's go off to the very far distant cedar forest and there go and kill Humaba. Now, who is Humaba? Well, he's this monster that guards the forest. Now, this is, I mean, this is the way the story is redacted. Probably what happened is what? Well, they probably wanted to go and get some wood or something, and so they needed to go in to destroy a civilization or a city or whatever and get the wood. But you can't, I mean, it's kind of boring to just say we went, we went and basically jacked another town, so instead we get to go and we get to fight Humaba, this monster, right, to get this wood. So they do. Um, however, it's important to point out that Yurik's elders, as well as Inkadu, suggest this is probably not a good idea. There will be implications down the line. You might put a star next to that because that's exactly what will happen, okay? Um, um, so, they, so they do, they go on this quest. Um, they get to Shamash, the sun god, who will help them to defeat um, um, uh, the, this monster, uh, hum, Humbaba, okay? The, this monster who, defeat, who guards the forest, okay? Um, and Enkidu um, will uh, say to Gilgamesh as they're fighting this uh, this monster, um, the, or, uh, this Hamaba, um, uh, Gilgamesh is not sure he wants to kill him. And in fact, ironically, he will say, I, I think I'm going to show him mercy. Interestingly, ironically, it will be Enkidu that says, no, we got to jack him. And so he does. All right, so they kill him. All right, and then right away, they, they decide, you know what, we need to do something important. So they cut down the tallest tree in the forest to sacrifice to the gods. They make, a, um, they make out of it a, uh, a build a raft, and then they sail down the Euphrates, okay? With, by the way, Humbaba's head. We, uh, you might put a star next to this one and remind yourself, here in a bit when we study our Beowulf, um, we're going to have the head of a monster that will be brought, brought back to, uh, the, um, to Herat Hall for a trophy. So let's get that one in our notes. We have this notion of trophies. We see this for sure in the Iliad, don't we? We, for example, will have Odysseus actually cutting off the head of Dolan, you'll maybe remember in the Iliad, right, on one of those night forays. But for sure, you take the armor or you do nasties to the corpse. Same gigs going on here, okay? Our next adventure has to do with Ishtar. Okay, so that's our next part. So this is part three of our story. Ishtar is Anu's daughter. Think Athena as the goddess uh, who is the daughter of Zeus, okay? She wants Gilgamesh. She wants to sleep with him. She wants to marry him. Gilgamesh will reject Ishtar and say, here's the problem. Every man that sleeps with you ends up dead. Uh, I'm not really interested. It doesn't go well. Think about, of course, Odysseus with Calypso and her offer of immortality in, in Odyssey 5, right? Ishtar, you can kind of predict this one, right? Ishtar gets mad, right? And she sends the bull of heaven, whatever that is, to punish um, Gilgamesh and Enkidu, right? And, of course, Gilgamesh and Enkidu now have to have another major fight. So you can kind of see this tradition, right? Um, and so they do. Um, together, they kill the bull of heaven. Ishtar shows up on the ramparts or the battlements of, of Yurik, and Enkidu throws <laughs> the leg of the bull of heaven at Ishtar and insults her. Well, this is probably not the wisest thing to do, and we then have this interesting episode with Enkidu and his dream. Now, let's pause for a moment and put this in our notes. Dreams are really important 
in epic mythology, right? We think a lot about the different dreams that will happen. Remember, it's Achilles in a dream that will have Patroclus come to him as a ghost and say, please bury me. Why, well, multiple dreams in the Odyssey. Telemachus will be told to go and find his father by Athena in a dream. Penelope will be visited in a dream. Obviously, in the biblical tradition, we have lots and lots of dreams. The famous dream of Pharaoh that's interpreted by Joseph. I mean, these dream, these dream kinds of things are really important. Enkidu's dream, well, the gods are mad. Right? Why? Because he killed Humbaba, they chopped down the famous cedar tree, they killed the bull of heaven and insulted, obviously, Ishtar. And in the dream, Enkidu is told that either he or Gilgamesh must die. Right? Um, and the god Enil, uh, here, think about Hades if you want to, will say it's Enkidu that must die. Very quickly, Enkidu falls ill, he has a terrible suffering, and he dies. Significantly, Gilgamesh watches this all happen. And it's kind of weird because it's almost like Gilgamesh, think here of a young Gudama Buddha who is raised without ever seeing those terrible things like a sick body or an old person, right? And all of a sudden he sees suffering and he's like, whoa, 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 you mean I don't get to remain strong, young, and virile all my life? And, it, and, and for the first moment, it seems, in our, in our epic poem, Gilgamesh identifies with the death of Enkidu. In other words, he's like, you know, I'm kind of like Enkidu. We're similar in strength, we're similar in build, we both are very popular, but Enkidu, he died. If Enkidu can die, then it's possible maybe someday I will die. Now, the great scholar Mike Zagruz has, has commented on this moment as maybe the birth of this notion of ego. The idea of, as the Bhagavad Gita says it, to recognize in yourself in all being and your being uh, in, in all others, right? And, and this notion that in fact there's, we're symbiotic in the fact that we all have to live. We often have said it as the only difference between you and a fly is you know about fly swatters, right? Think about the importance of epic stories that we call epics as this moment of enlightenment that Gilgamesh is going through. In other words, one thing that Epic does for us is it reminds us we don't, we don't I mean, you ain't met no 200 year old people. We don't get to live forever. You're here for a while. While you're here for a while, you obviously have to, you know, do certain things, but then you're not here for any longer, you know, that notion. So Gilgamesh then will decide with this insight, and obviously through the grieving process of losing his best pal, and you can obviously think here about losing your best pal and what that means in terms of the Iliad with Achilles losing Patroclus. I mean, that's probably the easiest one-to-one -one correlation right away, right? And so, a grieving process. And now we're ready for the next part of the epic poem, Gilgamesh and his famous Odyssey or Journey. And this is kind of the way that the poem will end, all right? Well, if you're gonna go on a journey, it helps to go on a journey to a place you've never been. And because Gilgamesh has already gone to the great forest of the cedar and all of that and had his first adventure, he's gonna to have to go even further to the ends of the earth, all right? Think about maybe we would say Phaeacia in the land of the Phaeacians in the Odyssey. It's out there on the very outer edge and that's where he goes. And he wants to go and speak with Utnapishtim okay the only human ever granted immortality and so that's where he decides he needs to go right i mean this is kind of like that quest for immortality and it always seems to involve going and talking with someone remember odysseus in book 11 of the odyssey has to go and talk to tiresias right so you've got this same gig being played right first of all long journey nearly dying several times okay he gets to Mount Meshu. Now think about the importance of mountains. I mean, we immediately think of, of Zion and Sinai, uh, Horeb in the Old Testament tradition. We think about mountains all the way through many of our epic poems, right? The mountain, my, uh, the Mount Meshu, that's where he goes. There, uh, this is kind of not real clear, but uh, he, he meets a couple of scorpion men or something, kind of like scorpion beings, okay, um, who guard the rising sun. They let um, Gilgamesh travel to the underside of the world. Think, of course, about the significance. If you're going to be a major epic hero, you have to travel to the underworld, right? Okay, we think about all of the different journeys to the underworld that the Greek mythologies will offer to us. 
Heracles will go. Obviously, Odysseus went right. Um, the uh, I mean, we think about, uh, of course, Dante's famous trip into the underworld. Uh, um, this is all part of the gig, right? Okay. Of course, Virgil will send Aeneas into the underworld as well, right? Um, Orpheus will go in the poetic tradition in the Greek myths as well, right? So down we're going to go to the underworld there. And guess what? No big shock here. He almost dies, right? Um, we, again, this is kind of part of the story, the motif, right? The hero is courageous enough to go stand in the face of death. Note the irony of this, by the way. The goal is to find immortality, the, the secret of immortality from Utnapishtim, uh, but you almost die in the, you know, in the uh, attempts you know, to try and get there or whatever. Okay, so down there, I mean, uh, um, you know, it's kind of weird. It doesn't, it doesn't always make sense that he runs into an inn hotel and an innkeeper, um, Sadiru, okay? And there the innkeeper will tell him that you need to go to uh, Arushnababi, and Arushnababi is this fairy man, okay, who's going to take Gilgamesh across the waters of death. Now, it's fascinating that this is a poem that predates anything that we will have, for example, in the Iliad of the Odyssey, and yet we'll have a lot of references to this kind of idea, that there's this special place of the dead, and of course in Odyssey 11, as you'll remember in our detailed lecture of that, of that part of it, we've got that journey, there's all these special rules about going down into the underworld, Notice you have to have special people that you meet down there. There's usually water involved. That's interesting, right? you got to go across special rivers and the like. When we do our study of Milton's Paradise Lost, we're going to see this whole thing about important rivers again and all of that, all right? So down he goes, all right? Um, and he gets to, uh, you know, across the waters of death. And there he gets to speak with Udnapishtim. It's awesome. So he finally gets to talk. Hurrah! After all of these journeys, he finally gets to speak with Utnapishtim. Isn't that awesome? And when he gets there, Utnapishtim says, sorry, can't help you. Got no ability to help you out here. Um, all men must die. So in other words, you made this whole long journey, can't help you. Um, um, and then Utnapishtim tells a story, which will, of course, become the heart of a whole lot of debate after this poem is finally discovered in, 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 the, uh, in the 1800s or so. Okay. It tells of a flood narrative.